Good morning, everyone. My name is Jose Barreiro, and I am the Assistant Director for Research and Director of the Office of Latin America at the National Museum of the American Indian. Welcome to the National Museum of the American Indian. On behalf of the museum, I welcome you to empowering indigenous women and their communities, the first of two forums taking place under the rubric Native Chilean Women, Challenges, and Opportunities. These forums are presented as part of Caruquinca, Chilean Patagonian Artists of the Land Where the Trees Talk. It's a festival as the country of Chile celebrates its native cultures at this museum. The second forum, the role of women in the preservation of indigenous cultures and languages, will take place on Saturday, October 4th, also from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. in this museum a theater, the Rasmussen Theater. We hope that you are able to join us for that program also. I would like to welcome our native panelists from Chile, Maria Francisca Coyipal, Mapuche, Anakena Manu Tomatoma, Rapanui, and Sonia Avalos, Quechua. We're also honored to welcome Jacqueline Pata of the National Congress of American Indians, who will expand these perspectives with her experience as a member of the Raven Sokai clan of the Tlingit Nation. Empowering indigenous women and their communities is an essential and important topic. And we look forward to hearing from our panelists and the discussion that will follow their presentations. We have enjoyed a long and productive relationship with the Embassy of Chile with diverse programs that have enhanced our mutual interest in educating museum visitors and the general public about the rich and complex cultures of native peoples of the Western Hemisphere. I wish in particular to thank Francisca Rojas of the political department of the Embassy of Chile, who has done so much to bring today's forum to the National Museum of the American Indian. I would also like to thank Freedom House and the National Congress of American Indians for their strong partnering on these forums on native Chilean women. Before our formal program begins, please, just a housekeeping reminder, Please, if you have a cell phone, take this opportunity to turn it off so that we don't disrupt the program. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's program, Dr. Chloe Schrenke. Dr. Schrenke is Vice President of Global Programs at Freedom House. In this role, she oversees Freedom House's emergency assistance funds, including the Lifeline Fund which supports embattled civil society organizations and Dignity for All, which supports LGBTI advocates under threat and three other similar funds. She also oversees global programs on freedom of expression, internet freedom, LGBTI issues, and gender equality. Prior to this appointment, Schrenke served as an Obama administration appointee at the U.S. Agency for International Development, both as a senior advisor on LGBT policy globally and as senior advisor on democracy, human rights, and governance for Sub-Saharan Africa. As USAID formulated their new strategy on democracy, human rights, and governance, she provided leadership on embracing a development-focused vision of human rights and human dignity that concentrates not only on protecting human rights, but also on expanding capabilities, opportunities, and freedoms. Schrenke's career as a development practitioner and academic extends over three decades of experience, including 15 years of work based in Africa and Asia. Her career is characterized by innovative accomplishments in advancing international respect for human rights of vulnerable and marginalized persons, advancing gender equality, and facilitating the emergence of ethical democratic leaders throughout the developing world. She's also distinguished by her strong record in publications, public speaking, and advocacy. Please help me welcome Dr. Chloe Schrenk.
you for that wonderful introduction. I hope I can live up to it. We have today a distinguished panel and a panel that I think you're going to find fascinating. Each one of them comes from a different part of the world, three from Chile, but from different cultural traditions. When I say three from Chile, one is from Easter Island, from Rapa Nui, which of course is part of, is under Chile's oversight and governance. So we're gonna hear some very different perspectives today. We also have Jacqueline Pata to give us a more embracing and Western hemisphere view that's gonna be very important to hear as well. I would ask for you to listen carefully to each of them as they talk about the cultural context in which they exercise leadership. You have before you four remarkable leaders. And what does leadership mean when you come from an indigenous traditional society? What does that mean? It's, some of us might think that means that they're very constrained in what a woman can do within traditional boundaries. My guess is you're gonna hear a different story today. You're gonna to find that these women have a very potent way of exercising leadership within their particular cultures. We will start today, um, let me just say that we're gonna have all four speakers speak and then open it up for question and answer. So please jot down questions you have. I'm doing that on purpose because I want to build a sense of what are the continuities, what are the common grounds between the four presentations. Um, you'll notice some big differences too, but please write down some of your questions. We're gonna save plenty of time for question and answer, which I will moderate after the four speakers have their chance to talk. <coughs> Our first speaker today is going to be Maria from uh, the Mapuche people. Um, she's going to be very, very much talking about how the women in the Mapuche people are able to be heard. And I think that's a really important way of framing her, her talk. She will be followed by Sonia from the Quechua people. Sonia has a remarkable way of labeling her talk about it being a fight against time what her people are involved in. And I think that's a wonderful way to, to look at that. Jackie Pata will then come in and talk um, again from a Western Hemisphere perspective, but also in her particular and unique role in, in the Congress and in her many years of experience working with many, many indigenous people, particularly women. And at the end, we have Anakena from Rapa Nui from Easter Island who's gonna bring a very distinctive perspective and hopefully wrap this up in a way that pulls all the threads together and whatever threads she doesn't pull together, I will attempt to do that myself. Um, each speaker will have about 10 minutes. They're gonna try very hard. They, they could, each one could talk all day. <laughs> they have so much to say and it's so much <coughs> important to share, but they will be constrained. They will speak for about 10 minutes each and then we will move on and I encourage you to be good participants in the question and answer period. Thank you. Ant, over to you first, please. Mari Mari Lamien, Mari Mari Compuche, Inche Francisca Goyipal Pinien. Good morning. <laughs> my, uh, my English is very bad. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Francisca Goyipal. I am from uh, Chile, south sud of Chile. Um, pertenezco al pueblo mapuche, eh, la Mapuche. mayor población people. chilena de los pueblos indígenas, indigenous de population in Chile, there were nine peoples nationwide. Eh, we are lo located geographically del from the center, sur, center of the country all eh, the way down to the far south. Our population are based on the last latest la census which was conducted eh, in 2012. It shows that, revealed that we have 11.11% of the Chilean population we make up of which approximately a million are women. Eh, we have endured different types of aggression that historically speaking are well known, which has pushed us away from our place of origin. We've had to migrate towards urban areas. Currently, 33.3% of, of the population are in located in urban areas. Statistics show us that we are 
in todos sentidos, education, are very eh, salud, low in all eh, areas, lenguaje, education, healthcare, lenguaje, language, in the loss of our language, but much far below the national eh, average, which is very worrying for our eh, and troublesome for our people. Our ancestral authorities, Machi, which are called Long, Machi, Lonco, Toki, Huerquen, Quinche, each day are diminished because they have lost the, the most basic thing, which is keeping uh, our preserving our language. What is the role of women? Historically, women were in charge of, of maintaining customs in the community and, and the, kept the family going, supported the family, who were in charge of educating together with the elderly, the children, women, played an extremely important role throughout the entire Mapuche population. She was the center, the focus of the, of the household. Kids, today, we very sadly are part of the most insignificant part of the uh, segment of the Mapuche population, but this, this is not our part of our essence. This is not... The, our people are not to blame. It's, what's to blame is the entire system that has forced us to accept it, compelled us to accept it, like the like the church and the state itself. Today, we've gen what has emerged is it's called the indigenous conflict, is what it's termed in the media, which has been the, the response to the which has been the response of the Mapuche to all the uh, things we've. Uh, Oh, they've taken away our land. We don't have water. We don't have any place. Our forests, etc. It's the force of disappearance. They've they've completely disappeared. And they con con consumption per uh, uh, of water is not doesn't go beyond three liters. So, how can we uh, water our our cattle, which is very important uh, in, uh, a lot for our livelihood? Them, Mapuche women have had a very important role. The, they have suffered a lot as a, as a result of the violence throughout the Araucania region. Women have, to, has, have seen their children beaten by police and their husbands thrown in jail because they are demanding Re rebuilding of their territory, that, that to get back, recover their territories that, that the residents who have in, infringed and trespassed on their territory have come in and taken it. Women have seen their children and, and, their, and their, their, their land has been taken away. They don't have enough land to, to farm. And when democracy came back in 1992 in Chile, the, the government has engaged in a very, has, has taken over the land. And, and many times the land, even though we try to buy it back, it's sold at high prices and it's given back in hard conditions and they can no longer produce anything. And this has led to an important role to be able to, to create different programs to Im help to improve the education of our children and our population. Women can have better opportunities in education is what we're trying to bring about. The amount of people who today have acquired university degrees is quite high now, or at least higher, thanks to state intervention through scholarship programs. But unfortunately, not everybody has access to these possibilities. And so in the latest presidential mandate for President Michel Bachelet, she pledged to conduct to put into effect public policies to empower indigenous uh, women and in general and indigenous women and, and so since then many women have emerged uh, many leaders who have on their own and those because their organizations have put them in this place them in this role from indigenous organizations to create a space nationally to, to resort to the different ministries to be heard and in some way they can have a bearing on public policy and so this 
will emerge from the grassroots, from the people themselves, based on the actual needs that their children have, their husbands have, and they themselves have. The indigenous conflict has generated violence, not just, as I've explained before, on the population itself, on children, on, against women, but the men, when they see that they're always in battle, this generates intrafamily violence in families. It takes a toll on families. Many times, separations result from this. And, and you see what And this leads to greater impoverishment. Children are, are, are left to the grandparents the children suffer as a result of this, and therefore we need international support to be able to, to buttress this joint effort to, to, to be able to advocate on our behalf vis-a-vis -vis the government. And even though our pres president right now has committed to engage in this effort lately, in the current administration, she, the president, her actual commitment was to not apply the anti-terrorist rug, which was, which, would, would throw in jail for long periods of time for simply because they are trying to assert their social rights and the, because in their social demands. And the president, there was a presidential program that was put into place, and we were, I was invited to be part of different lines of strat strategies and, and public policies are going to be put into place. There's a, a, a public policy agenda. This sectoral agenda is is focused on different. Edu areas, edu education, bilingual education, cultural education. Together with this, the president has pledged to to introduce two bills. One is for a, an indigenous ministry and also a council of peoples. And this will ensure that women ha play a significant role within these groups in this effort that is going to uh, be made and is being made. And the 169, the Convention 169 of the or, uh, of the International Labor uh, Organization is has to do with consultation with indigenous people, and it's this is very related to the indigenous uh, minis ministry of indigenous affairs and the Council of of uh, peoples, and there's an opportunity. I've had the and for women to be able to develop professionally, to study, to go to college, and perhaps have a, a more overall view, acquire an overall view of our issues. What we've done for this purpose is we've worked very hard to be able to bring us together. We've, br we've met many times, we've convened with the, we've met with the current ministers to be able to, to uh, advocate in the social min affairs ministry to, to, under to explain what's at the bottom of our issues. The minister who's currently in charge of the Ministry of, the, of Women, the ministry of, ministry of Culture, we've met with them all. And what we've let them know is that these, this advocacy group is very very small and what we're, we continue to, to fight, we women, and we have to be able to lift up our people so that we all have equal opportunity. This is our commitment, and I know that we have, have very little time. I would like to say so much more. There's so much that I could tell you all, but I am very grateful to you for your inference, interest to learn about us and a, a little bit about what my beloved people are, are going through and what it means. We have an expression that we use in our people, which is, for fun. We, we don't applaud like you do. We go like this. That's what we say. I am Punchai, Wiracocha, Kaipi, Cancuna, Nyoka, Sonia, Avalos, Sumidse. Sumas Yakta, Quechuata, Ayun, Umaki, Calamamanta. Buenos días, autoridades presentes. Good morning, all the authorities present. My name is Sonia Avalos. I am head of the Quechua Sumas Yakta uh, community of Calma, Calama of the North. As an indigenous woman of the Quechua indigenous group, 70 years old, I have been able to witness the growth, the 
progress and the evolution of indigenous women. In our country, for many years, we, the Quechua, have had to struggle against laws, prohibitions, and restrictions that have been imposed on us from the time of our ancestors on, in our own lands. But no doubt, our greatest struggle has been against time because we have had to cling on to the hope that the seeds that we have been sowing from the time we began in this struggle will bear fruit in time. As an indigenous woman, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, collector, artisan, and farmer, I have had to be an Aiju, which is to say the head of one of the few indigenous communities that remain in the northern part of Chile. Because just like the eagle, we have had two options to suffer the price of prevailing in time or to disappear along the way. The path that that we have taken in this journey has been difficult being of wanting to be able to or doing what one must do to be able to leave a legacy and to leave one's mark in time but nobody told us that this would be easy that is why along the way we have had as one says uh, birth pains for our land our culture our identity and our descendants because the role of women in our community has been essential because from simply being mothers, artisans, gatherers, and homeowners, we have become the leaders of our community and of our indigenous group and identity. We are no longer incognito for society and uh, for our nation. For a long time, we were like a voice crying out in the desert. No one would hear what we had to say, but at the same time, no one could remain indifferent to our identity, which is something we will never lose. I have seen how we have gone forward, uh, sowing and at the same time harvesting fruits that others planted, just as others will harvest what we plant. Or the important thing is that one never stops sowing. As a community, it has been an immense honor for the name of our ethnic group, our culture, our custom, and our identity to be made known throughout Chile and abroad, for in one way or another, uh, opportunities and doors, uh, favorable opportunities and doors have been opened uh, for us indigenous women and likewise for our community. I'm talking about all of our uh, ethnic group, the, all, including the Aymara and the Quechua. Thank you very much. In my own language, I introduced myself. My Tlingit name is Kusin. My English name is Jacqueline Peta. And I am from the Raven Sakai clan. I come from Haines, Alaska, a small village in southeast. I come from the Chilkoot side on the Chilkoot River. Um, and it is just really a great honor to be able to be part of this panel with these strong women today. I was listening to them, at their introductions at the very beginning, and I recall as a young girl thinking about um, women in my society, in my cultural society. We have, in, in my language, Shah is woman, Shah. But if you say Shah, that means mountain. 
And I think that was intentional, that women are strong like mountains and that we have a really big place in our communities um, and, a, and a really great responsibility. So I want to start by telling you a story, a story about my auntie. Um, and, um, and it's a, lot of, a story that a lot of people don't know in the United States. But she was a, as a young woman. She was born in Petersburg, Alaska. And um, she was a member of my clan, the Sukha'adi people. And when she was an infant, she died and was adopted by another family. But she still grew up in our Tlingit culture. And as a young woman, she actually went to Washington State and got to go to college, which was very, very, very unusual um, for um, women during that time period. Um, it was in the so, and when she went to um, school, she fell in love with another Tlingit man, and his name was Roy, and they moved back to Alaska to work in a cannery, and they began raising a family, and this was during the 1940s. And they went for, to, in search for other opportunities to support their children, so they moved from the village of Klawak, where he was from, to, uh, to Juneau, which is the capital of today, is the capital of the state of Alaska. And so to them, that was moving to a big city. And instead of finding all the hope, they surrounded themselves by hate and prejudice. And as they were searching for housing in Juneau, they found landlords that wouldn't rent to natives. And there were signs that said, no natives allowed. And they were bound from being able to enter public houses and movie theaters and restaurants. And so, what, and, and so it was a big change for them. But what people learned really quickly was not to mess with a Tlingit woman. Um, because in 1941, Elizabeth Paradovich started organizing and she wrote petitions to the governor of the territory of Alaska. She proposed legislation called the Anti-Discrimination Act to ban those signs and, and racism. And after that, less, and, and after legislation was defeated in 1943, she could have given up, but she didn't. She organized the, and her husband, they organized the Alaska Native Sisterhood and Brotherhood, which is still in existence today. Um, and they called that organization of Alaska Native leaders across, the, uh, of, across Alaska. They also called National Congress of American Indians in that, a newly formed organization in 1944. The organization I work for today, and that's why this story is so important to me, because it's the story of my auntie who reached out to an organization where of native natives leaders across the country organizing to address these issues. And so um, they, in 1945, they, um, she gave a, her famous speech to the state of Alaska, and she said, who are these people, barely out of savagery, who want to associate with us whites with 5,000 years of recorded civilization behind us? That's what one of the government uh, legislators said. And she responded back, I would not have expected that I, who am who am barely out of savagery, would have to remind gentlemen with 5,000 years of recorded civilization behind them of our Bill of Rights. And her actions and her courage changed the course of history in Alaska. And in 1945, they passed the Anti-Discrimination Act into law, which allowed Alaska Natives the right to vote almost 20 years before the US Citizen Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of the 1964. So I, I tell you that story because um, I come from a matrilineal society, my cultural um, matrilineal society, and women have always had a place and a, and a voice. Um, we've always known that women stand behind um, and stand beside our, our men with various roles. And we also know in our cultural societies that there is important um, piece of balance. So as I listen to my sisters here from um, Chile, I, 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 I recognize that there's the balance, and when the balance is skewed, it creates a pro challenges in our communities. Um, when the balance of, our, of land is skewed for us, it creates another challenge for us. And so, um, like other indigenous com countries, N NCAI came to creation to try to be able to help rebalance our societies and to be able to make sure that as tribal governments we have the right of self-determination. And under this right of self-determination, um, we are able to practice our own laws that we create. Um, in the United States, the tribal governments are recognized as, the, as a sovereign nation 
um, in the constitutions. And it's our goal to continue to push those, those to be able to make sure that the rest of the other governments recognize and treat us equally as other governments under our, our, with our own sovereignty. Some ways of being able to do that is ways that Native women have engaged across this country. Um, Native vote is very important to us. It allows us to exercise our political right. We continue to urge others to vote. We assist in helping to get people out to vote. And we be able to make sure that those politicians really stand for their campaign promises that they give to us. Native women have also reached out with their own voices. One of the biggest political achievements that we've had in recent years is the fight against violence against women. And it started from Native women in the community saying, enough is enough. And we will no, lo no longer tolerate, to tolerate this violence against our women perpetrated by outsiders primarily and not being able to have the, the be able to address those issues within our own communities and have the rights within our own tribal governments and our tribal law enforcement systems. And so we were able to pass the Violence Against Women Act. And just last week, I was in New York at the World Conference of Indigenous Peoples, where we were representing the rights of Native women to be able to ask the UN to continue to monitor the violence against women, but not only for the United States, but for all of our indigenous women globally. And to be able to also ask for the rights of protections, to be able to make sure that we protect our, our native children so that they can live, have the ability to live in their own indigenous cultures and to not be taken from their homes with outside of the will of our tribal communities and outside of their families. And, and, as, and particularly to be able to ask that we also take care of Mother Earth as we look at climate change initiatives and how it impacts the communities and the foods that we're able to harvest in our own communities. So those are just some of the things that we do at in, in NCAI. I wanna talk about, just real quickly, I know I only have a few minutes, but we're launching this year an initiative called First Kids First. It's really recognizing that first Americans need to become first in our minds as we deal with trying to change the dynamic, the social dynamic that's impairing our children. It is no secret that Native Americans die at the, under suicide higher than any, two and a half times higher rate than any other groups in the United States. It's no secret that our kids are suffering from lack of education and academic success or that we have challenges in healthcare still prevailing. And so one of the things that we're doing at NCAI is say, saying, and we went first to our Native women to say, join us, us. As you join with Violence Against Women and saying enough is enough, join with us to be able to say that to, to our Native youth and our Native children, love them, hold them, that we put them first, that we'll do the things that we need to be able to raise them up, that we will give them the support, that we'll have the policies, but we will reach out individually and take personal responsibility. Similar to the pay it forward concept, pay it forward is really about taking our children and bringing them forward. And so we're trying to change the social consciousness in our communities that we really change the societal um, impacts for the future of our children. So I want to be able to end by being able to say that, just like my auntie said, just like these women have said and will say, um, so many Native women have found that our, we have a responsibility, not only in the cultural, um, bringing forward and continuing the cultures in our communities, um, not only being the educators of the next generation, but we have found our political voice and we found that we have a right place in that political pl place with, uh, sorry, I put a timer on myself and I didn't know it was gonna come off. And we, and we also found that it was important for us in the business society that we bring the values, the values that are important to our cultures and we bring them to the present with us. So with that, I'd like to say, may our voices be heard on my grandfather's land. Yorana Kuru Atatoa, Toku Ingoa, Kwanda Kena Manutoma Toma. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Anakena Manutoma Toma. Yo vengo desde Rapa Nui. Represento a la mujer Rapa Nui. Yo represento a la mujer Rapa Nui. 
I am part of the Development Commission, which is an entity that's been put in place by the government of Chile, which is part of the indigenous law, where an exception is made for the Rapa Nui people, and a Development Commission is established that includes the various ministries of Chile and the representatives of the people. Normally, it were the men who had represented the Rapa Nui people for a long time, from the year 2000 forward. Nonetheless, today, I am the second Rapa Nui woman to represent my people. Beyond telling you about the problems we face, or the fact of being a woman or not a woman, our people has a very sad history that it narrates from time immemorial, where a Dutch a, a mariner was going by Rapa Nui and discovered Rapa Nui, and he, because it was the day of resurrection of Christ, he called it Easter Island. Nonetheless, we already were living on our island, and the island had the name Rapa Nui. He's very famous internationally, but what he did for us was harm because he put us on a map which in subsequent years when slavery was abolished in Peru, there was nothing to do more to do than to look in Polynesia and thanks to this map that he drew, people went there and started, started taking them away from our lands. They killed our kings and our princes. They killed the people who had the knowledge of reading uh, Rongolongo, they knew, they, they killed our wise people, they decimated our population, and uh, there were, we were not very many people left in, uh, in the 1880s, uh, there was a annexation agreement with uh, Chile where our, uh, it was our Chile, represented by a captain of a Navy boat. Well, at that time, we didn't speak Spanish. Nonetheless, our king took up the grass symbolically, handed it over to the mariner, and that meant giving them the right to safeguard us and to be part of them. Nonetheless, he took the piece of land, and he kissed it and kept it for himself. And that meant that he was reserving the land for his people and for no one else. From there on, our work with Chile was that after those years, they leased us out, just like somebody might uh, lease out a farm with all the animals on it. Well, we were considered to be among the animals. We, the Rapa Nui, were distributed all across our island. Nonetheless, the new leader, the new owners of the island, those who had leased it, collected, brought us together and took us to one corner of the island called Hangaroa. Uh, they burned our farms, they stole our animals, they stole our uh, food, they raped the women, they abused, were abusive in their treatment. And that was our first connection with Chile. After that, those who uh, had and they tried to they were, uh, the lands were registered in the Chilean register. Since then, we have been calling for uh, vindicating our lands. In 1963, it was only in 1963 for Chile that we became citizens and had the right to vote. Before that, we were just anything. During uh, this time, they, they dressed up a person to be the king of the, uh, and had sent him to Chile, but he was poisoned in Valparaiso and made to disappear. Today, we as a people, while we have gone forward and uh, have many accomplishments, well, over time, we began to specialize in the laws of Chile, which is to say we thought there, there was a law called the Easter Law, which was a recognition by the state of the harm that it had caused to the Rapa Nui people. After that, the indigenous peoples of Chile were able to have the Easter Law or the indigenous law passed, and that law, as the Rapa Nui people, were able to accomplish different things. 
one of these is uh, that I am now representing my people. I was elected of the, um, among groups of men and women, well, of the women I had the vote, uh, highest vote. Our struggle is first uh, calling for our lands, which were registered as of 1933. The other thing we're working on is migration in 2007. We were able to win a constitutional amendment where Rapa Nui was categorized as a special territory. So we're working on a statute on territorial administration. We are doing things that make us different from others. And women just recently began taking positions in politics of the Rapa Nui. Before that, it was the men who were the directing things, even though we are a matriarchal culture, the Rapa Nui. But today, there's, well, there's a woman who is a Rapa Nui, who is a governor. There is a mayor, woman, a woman is a mayor who left, finished her term. There are council members who are women, Rapa Nui, and a Rapa Nui woman who represents us on an interministerial roundtable with the government of Chile. Nonetheless, despite all of the ill treatment we've uh, that is, uh, we've been subjected to, we trust in people, and therefore we continue to believe that the current administration under Michel Bachelet will hopefully promulgate uh, the migration law and the law on our special status. But despite all that, we would like to believe that a better future is coming, and that perhaps tomorrow, colonizing states such as Chile can actually hand power and the rights of indigenous peoples to have their own land and to have the right to administer their own lands nonetheless. Even though it is said time and again in various international forums, I see this as quite far off. Nonetheless, there is a possibility today of the Ministry for Indigenous Affairs being created in Chile. The CONADI, the National Commission uh, of Indigenous, exists. We realize that when it comes down to it, what is done is to ensure positions for anyone other than one who is a true member of the particular indigenous community. What it remains for me to say is that it is the Rapa Nui women who give life to the children, who raise them, who teach them, uh, who teach them history, uh, song, dance, and their culture. Well, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was, as I build, a very powerful presentation by four very significant leaders in their respective cultural groups. And within the larger framework of Chile itself, and in the case of Jackie, within the larger framework of indigenous peoples and indigenous women in the Western Hemisphere. I wanted to just pick out a few points that really jumped out at me, and hopefully you will have your own to ask questions from. But certainly, um, starting with Maria, um, the whole notion of indigenous conflict one and what moment, that means. No, traducción, traducción. Uh, we're having trouble with okay. the translation. Okay. Is that working now? Okay, good. She mentioned and framed her conversation, her discussion, her presentation around this notion of indigenous conflict. And that extends quite widely, environment, lands, the people themselves, their whole integrity. Um, but she did mention that there have been benefits, that there have been people within her, her group that have benefited from the government. The theme that you've heard from her first and will hear from all our speakers has been the one of domestic violence and gender-based violence. So that's an important consideration to carry forward as we think about how, what questions we want to ask our panelists. She also took on the responsibility of women to lift up their people. That was her expression, and that's something that I heard resonating across all of our speakers. Sonia talked, again, as I, as I 
introduced before of the fight against time, the struggle against time. But she did it in a wonderful way of talking about sowing seeds and expecting positive outcomes, expecting change to happen. And all of the women that have spoken today have been remarkably positive, even against a remarkable history of struggle in, in many cases. So that's a really important share, uh, point that she's shared. Um, she really portrayed women, though, as strong leaders in their communities. These are not people who are victims. And I want to reinforce that. No one at this table is a victim. And they're not describing their women and their culture as victims. They're, they're people who are empowered to make change happen. Uh, I love what, how, she, how Sonia ended by saying, one never stops sewing. Jackie's wonderful metaphor of women, or actually linguistic metaphor of women and mountain being a very similar word pronounced slightly differently, but wow, that's really strong. That's a really impressive way to think about that. It also was wonderful the way she talked about women leadership in women standing beside their men, not behind, not in front. And that brings the whole notion of gender equality of men and women finding new and important ways to build their societies together, to bring their special gifts together, to do what needs to be done against often remarkable challenges. And I think that was really important. She also had a, a wonderful way of describing the problems of gender-based violence, but then immediately, immediately linking that to the the first kids first idea of how we take a situation that's so daunting, that's so challenging, violence, and convert it through love. Convert it through love to look at the children and how we actually use that love and through love promote their futures as well, which is, is a wonderful message to carry forward. Anakina was I think a very provocative speaker, and I admire her for being provocative. She brought to uh, very clear focus the troubled history that she, Rapa Nui has had with their, in effect, colonial power Chile, but how the Chilean people have come to learn to respect the people of Rapa Nui. Um, that's been a respect that the Rapa Nui people have had to fight for and have had to earn. But their struggle to be respected and to be consulted seems to be bearing fruit from what she had to say. And in particular, the way that women have moved into that space, have found themselves, and that's actually not a fair way to put it, they didn't find themselves, they worked hard to put themselves in a really important leadership position within their communities, and they're there now. They're there now and they're making a difference. So my brief summary, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and begin with just a question or two to get them started, and then it's going to be over to you. I'll continue to moderate. I will remind our panelists to use their microphones when they're speaking. We also will have a microphone for you when it comes time to ask questions yourselves. But I wanted to begin first with our three Chilean women. Um, we have a really interesting situation in Chile with a, a woman president the first woman president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet, who is regarded by many, many people in Chile and here and beyond as a feminist, as a strong feminist, as someone who has done a lot for women and has passed laws and led initiatives to address issues like gender-based violence, has been an advocate for men and women working together in the context of gender equality. Um, she's respected in that context. I want to see if that's something that, although we hear this from the non-indigenous people of Chile, I'd like to ask our three panelists, is, is this something that you feel as well? Is, has the president of Chile really been a powerful influence in helping and supporting the women of your people to be stronger, to be respected, to be effective? So any one of the three of you who would like to Address that first. It's over to you. Don't be shy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there we go. That's something these women don't have to worry about. Uh, no. 
No, eh, no nos conocen. What? No, <laughs> we're not no shy. We have no, eh, no shyness eh, whatsoever, believe me. Michelle Bachelet, when she entered into office for the first time as president, I believe most women, we were so happy. Men were very anguish-ridden. And that is what made the difference. We heard men say, oh my God, women are going to be bossing us around and how horrible, what suffering. But at that time, there was a big, a sea change in society where women, without any embarrassment, wore, wore the presidential sash on the street. We were happy because we knew this was the time for us to empower ourselves and take the reins ourselves and go back to what we were at one time in the past. Now, the Mapuche people, we women are those who, who vote the most. We go to the polls and vote the most in the last elections, which was, remember, voting is, is voluntary. In the past, it had been mandatory, but now it's, it's uh, optional. The highest percentage percentage of the population were women, particularly in the Mapuches. We were the ones, 10 kilometers where they would walk, Mapuche women, to cast their vote for our president. And they, that was, they, she was one of theirs. And they would, this is shared by all, uh, I don't know if I can call it feminists, because it's not exactly the same concepts, but they're, men who are our authorities, our senior officials, and, and it did drop uh, the, the, the uh, ministry, for example, the, the amount of f women governors and ministers had gone down. And that's odd. We have to politically take a look at why did this happen, that all of a sudden there was a drop in the number of positions held by women in the ministries and in government etc. We are concerned. Indigenous women and Mapuche women, we only have one Diaguita, one congresswoman. And at the second level, we have one director, female director, that is, woman director of older adults, that is, for the elderly, seniors. We have one position of, with, a, with a, a woman. And as far as, as far as ambassadorships, and we don't have any women. So we are sort of a bit disappointed in these positions not being filled by women. And she felt this. President Bachelet felt this, that we were a bit upset about this. Thank you. Any, of, any additions from our other panelists? Okay. Um, let me, are you going to say something, Ana Karen? Sí. Excellent. Eh, Look, beyond talking about whether the president's a feminist or not, the fact is she's a woman, and a woman is, takes, it makes decision from her heart and from her mind, and her. Esa hace la gran diferencia entre las decisiones o las cosas que está generando o va a generar a lo mejor esta presidenta para el futuro de las mujeres. This or will. But the president for Chile, we as a, our experience as a people is that when she was the minister of health of the government, she pr prom promised a hospital for the Rapanui. When she became a president of the republic, she put together this project and she implemented it dur during her first term as president. The Rapanui, we worked on the special status for territorial Spanish for the uh, statute uh, for the uh, Rapanui. And we were successful at changing the constitution to make it a special territory, the uh, Easter Island, the Rapanui. When she worked on immigration during the government of President, the next president, we, the Pre the hospital that was approved by Ms. Bachelet was built, and the law was that he changed it. 
the law, that is, and, and left us at a disadvantage, our people. Is, so the proposal put forward by the president, Bachelet, was much better than what was actually approved. And once again, there has been a interministerial committee created or table where we, uh, the Rapanui, are represented, and we speak on an equal basis with the minister there. The promises from before that she made, we can now try to implement and get approved the immigration law and uh, now that she's back in the office of the presidency. I am very much in agreement with our president. The, our, the leadership that we have spearheaded and that we're on an equal on an equal basis with men. Now the only thing we need to work a bit on is to earn, earn the same equal pay for equal work. Where those who work on in mines and heavy machinery should be earning the same as well. And so we are doing quite well in this, but, but as communities, I, I, we're not in agreement. Article 100, uh, that is, uh, Convention 169 of the ILO is what we're, when she was president for the first time, decree 124 and 125 were issued by her. Now, uh, decree 40 and 66 are in effect. So all of us as indigenous people can't agree with this. We want, we don't want to be harmed by, uh, un, we want Convention 169 to actually be respected. It, uh, under our indigenous law, and we don't believe that's happening. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask a quick question now to Jacqueline. I don't want to leave her out. And that is, she's got a unique view of working with the Congress and with, with indigenous peoples from many, many different locations. And my question to you, Jackie, is what can be shared from your experiences across many, many different indigenous peoples what can be shared with the indigenous people of Rapa Nui and of Chile mainland, and what do you think you can learn from them? I find it interesting. Um, we're lucky we have the Embassy of Tribal Nations here in Washington, D.C., and so we get a lot of international indigenous peoples who come to visit us, and a lot of, of their states actually help promote them to come to visit us. And the reason being is, um, uh, you know, the reason being is some of their states, their governments, um, recognize that the way that we are organized in the United States is helpful for engagement. Something that the indigenous nations across the world have asked for is the right of free fr prior and informed consent, which means that we need to know about policies that are affecting us, we need to be at the table to help make decisions about policies that are affecting us, and we need to be able to be a decision maker that says we agree or not agree at the end of the day to those recommendations. And in most of the indigenous countries across the world and indigenous peoples have not been engaged, um, not, not because we haven't chosen to be engaged, but haven't been given the right to be at the table for making the decisions that affect their environments, their education, and their women. Um, and so organizing in a consensual way where we as peoples collectively organize. So we in the United States under the, under the National Congress of American Indians organized as a Congress similar to the Congress of the United States. And it represents the tribal governments and they're credentialed and they vote and they put forward resolutions and then that gives me my action plan for moving forward. Um, and as other um, and now we're looking towards wanting to be able to, and we've taken to the UN, um, a position that indigenous peoples who have representative governments need to be respected. And across this line of conversations, I heard all about respect. That indigenous governments who are governments and the same as any other government need to be respected and have a respected voice at the forums of the UN. And I think in order to make that happen as we as indigenous peoples, as we meet each other, need to recognize that we need to um, 
create vehicles of our governments to collaborate together in that same nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Okay, over to you. We, who's got the microphone? Someone going to be passing? Oh, they're in the back. Okay. Um, so please raise your hand. You can address your question to any or all of the panelists, and it would be wonderful if you would just say your name, and if you have an affiliation to share, that would be wonderful too. So who would like to go first? And I don't want you to be shy either. Yes, in the back, please. Thank you very much. My question, my big question is, as the lady of Alaska has just said, the union of, of indigenous peoples together with states, usually there's a huge failure. The we, as Rapa Nui, we always view the state works on the basis of their own vision and their own needs as a state, where just Puede recently, however, one could ask, al pueblo originario, and, and now consults, that is, the indigenous people based on it, tiene, its conviction no and its strength para uh, of the state. Many states don't have this ability to bring together the indigenous peoples in their own nation and, and, and reach out and engage in the, for example, like in the United States, your, your Congress or perhaps, perhaps of the, the entire planet to bring them all together. Well, we see that our state in Chile many times doesn't have this link, this connection to the indigenous people or and the uh, resources is available for this. We wouldn't be here for this. It's, very, it's great that this has happened, and thank you for bringing us together for this meeting, but many times this is the great shortcoming that we've seen, is that I hear it and I see it here. The, my big question is, therefore, are the conditions in place based on, according to the state for this type of forum to be able to invite and facilitate resources for involvement and participation of the rest of the indigenous peoples of the world, obviously, at their uh, convenience and uh, to be able to do this. Democracy has a price. Democracy doesn't just happen. It, it needs support. It needs infrastructure. It needs money. So would any of the panelists like to speak to that? We'll start with Jackie. I'd like to start, um, and I know others probably want to join, but you know, this is one of the questions that I get asked. I, I, I'm lucky enough that sometimes I travel to other countries to have these conversations, and um, when I went to Argentina and went to a lot of the villages um, and m met with a lot of the grassroots organizers, this was the question, which was how do we actually organize ourselves and we have no resources? That was the same question that tribal governments asked themselves in 1944, but we were being terminated by Congress, politically terminated by acts of Congress, and it was those bake sales, at the hands of women, I might add, but those bake sales and those other things that pooled together the small amount of resources to actually to begin. Um, and I know that's difficult and it's challenging, especially when the the you know economic the economies are really poor, um, but pooling together and identifying you know just a, a a couple of representatives or people that can you can speak your voices with is very helpful, um, and forums for being able to make that that work. So don't be afraid to start small. You got to start somewhere. I also worked with like Australia and Canada and other groups who have taken a model similar to NCAI. Um, and has this, this Congress kind of um, group. Um, but they've been heavily dependent upon the state's funding. And so when their relationship is not so good with their government, their resources so decline. And I would beg not to be dependent upon your states to find the answer for you. Um, you know, at NCAI, we try to strike a balance. We may do some work with the government, um, but only as we determine. And because we don't want to be the voice of the government, we want to be 
an outreach to be able to um, help develop those relationships. So that would just be a little bit of advice I would give. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Any of the other panelists, Maria? Sí. Sí. Okay. Eh, right. Bueno, yo voy a dar una, un, hacer un comentario relacionado con una mirada point of view of my country. I be, what I believe is that, unfortunately, what has happened, I think, historically speaking, has been that those, I'm talking about indigenous, Mapuche indigenous women, because I can't talk about what happens in other places, my, my sisters up here in other places, but the individuals that have been sent as envoys and to represent us, it's always the same individuals. And unfortunately, when they come back, they do not replicate what has been learned and to develop a working strategy with private enterprise, for example, to be able to boost a domestic activity at the level of the people of the country of the region etc this is not replicated with it doesn't have an, a, re, a, a multiplying effect that's what happens with us with regard to our administration it's we we have to demand we do demand that there's got to be diversification in our representation there has to be opportunities for other leaders to be able to engage in the international forum in this in this regard and to be and the grassroots have to be one what's been mentioned here and discusses that we've had the opportunity to uh, to have dialogue with the members that are here and other people and I've seen we we hope to be able to see many of you in Chile but it would be very important to have this kind of exchange this contact this direct communication so that some way we can generate this way of working we have to be able to fund this this could be mutually supported both by from the country of origin as well to the hosting country it could be funded by jointly together with this I would like to State. The, I would let you know that this meeting today, I forget the meeting we have with the, uh, uh, Francisco, you know, Francisco Rojas, can you tell us? It was a congressman we met with, right? Yes. From Samoa, from American Samoa. I forgot the name from the, it was, a, it's, it's difficult to remember all these names. But in specifically, I am very happy with that meeting because I realize we have a Mapuche ambassador who's representing Chile and Guatemala and who this could be the link that could lead to these working liaisons. Perhaps we can create this and come up with a commitment, which I'd like to state here, and I will bring back to my land with it, is to, to, to uh, draw closer in our relations with each other, have a stronger relation. Now, with regard with what was the original people, in other words, the indigenous people many times have forum in the UN, but they come to speak on behalf of indigenous people. And it's never, many times, it's not even someone who's a member of the indigenous people. The fact that you have a last name that seems that you are a member of it, the people think you are, whether or not Rapa Nui. We form a people. We don't divide up as different communities or corporations. We're a single people. We're the Rapa Nui First Nation, and we are have a representative. And there's five people and the Council of, of Elder, of the Elder. But when we have to be represented, we need to. People from the government come. Uh, and uh, represent us on our behalf a lot of times. I, I think that's not, we're not the only ones that this happens to, but it's a lot of people in Chile. And if this was an opportunity, if, if, it, if it could be changed, this should be changed. Those who speak on behalf of a people, digital people, should be people from the actual people. It's not the same. Thing. And then with regard to consultation, the right to prior informed and free consultation under Convention uh, 169 of the ILO, it says that it is binding in as much as it is mandatory for a, for a state to uh, consult with a people when it's going to engage in a project in its territory and other things. But it's not 
de cuando salga la respuesta binding when the re our response is put forward we as Rapa Nui people we were the first people who who uh, engaged in a consultation under a convention 169 of the ILO and this was and there was supposed to be a project conducted and a, a member a Muay is the living face of, of our ancestors. The, a Muay was made to protect us and others. A Muay is, is, belongs to the Rapa Nui people. However, the ministry of the government had, had, had uh, uh, approved this project and when there was a consultation there was a minister of education who said i signed on this and this is going to happen one way or another <clears throat> however the rep we said it was not gonna when 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 the position is put forward by the people that's what should be and the moi was not supposed to happen and it did not happen and however it should have been part of the policy to, and not and, and not just be whatever government is in power at the time to decide, but we our position should be taken into account, it should be should definitive. As the, just as was said by my sister from the, of the Mapuche and of the Rapa Nui, the same thing has happened with us. People come into our land to do what Ever they please, they want a, a central a hydroelectric plant or other projects. They just take over with whatever they do, with a problem of water, the mining interests that come in. We have a we have a lot of copper, which helps the entire country, but. We, they've left no te, us without no any water. Caso, no they don't pay attention nada. to us. They don't Llegan, confer with us, consult with us on anything. And under Article no, 169 of the, of the International Labor Organization Convention, we, they are supposed to and we don't do it. They just do whatever they want. And now, there's been decrees that have been issued 40, 65 and 40 I mean, that, that, that harm us. And we don't agree with these decrees that are damaging to us. And so they abuse us. And they wanted it to continue to, you, to invade, trespass on lands that we farm. And what we wonder, what's going to happen? In Kalama, we, this is our homeland. This is our cradle. And what's going to happen? This is the vegetation. If, if they take us away from this original home, our, our home base, where are we going to go? Them? They let the mining interests come in? We're not against mining, but if they do approve these dams or these monuments, it's going to affect our well-being, and so therefore, and our children, our, our lives, and our livelihood, and so therefore, we are, we're talking about ILO Convention 169 and, and respect, full respect for it, and we do not want we don't want a, to be abused and that we want article or that is article 169 of the convention the ILA government should be respected and enforced the same people as he was saying represent us the same people come and represent us and this is uh, to get back to the question and they say nothing it's the same person coming here from I always go up to Germany. I was at a meeting in the United States and nothing happens they don't tell us there's no multiplying effect or anything there's no benefit but I don't think this way I have to let I've come up here I have to report to my people I engage in this report and I I bring the car, their cards calling cards and show them thank you very much I think you had a fairly unified answer there and one of the things at Freedom House when we work with marginalized people around the world we get the same message and it can be put simply as nothing about us without us mm -hmm. and I think that's what I heard from all of our speakers there Do we have still have some time for maybe two more questions Does anybody who would like to ask yes Maxine you know, there are speakers coming, the microphone's coming to you. Hi. Uh, I work with USAID uh, on indigenous issues, uh, indigenous peoples issues, because indigenous peoples and indigenous issues, you know, there's a difference. Um, and one of the things that has become very, very important 
to me and my work, um, alongside of the issues of indigenous peoples, are the issues of older people. And when we talk about inclusive development, we are really, really working hard to include LGBTI, um, women, youth, um, Afro-descent. But one of the things that I love best about indigenous culture is the foundational belief in cross-generational learning. And I see this in my sisters up here when uh, Maria talks about elders and women helping with the elders. Mm -hmm. And I see an elder right in front of me. Sonia is, you know, a role model. You know, when in the United States, we would look at, some, uh, at a woman of 70 years old and we would not be considering, you know, hopefully this will change, her leadership role. You know, we are in this country, perhaps because of urbanization, warehousing older people, where I see in the indigenous world, and Jackie points this out really well, you know, you learn at the feet of your aunties, you learn at the feet of your grandmas, you learn you, this intergenerational learning model. So when we talk about children committing suicide, where's the disconnect? Parents are busy trying to bring food home. Where, where are the kids learning who they are? And so I want to kind of commend you for your presentations, all of you, but also ask you, how can the indigenous world create models for the non-indigenous world? And how to be truly inclusive in development and truly inclusive of our people through all the stages of their lives? You know, what we always think about, you know, colonialism, well, what they brought here. Well, what about what the indigenous world can bring, particularly in that area, and what are the best ways to do it? Thank you, Maxine. A good question from a development agency person. And who would like to go, Maria? Okay. Bueno, All right, here we go. Palabras. Thank you for your quest, beautiful eh, word, comments and dirigente, your question. Aside from being a leader, años, I've been a leader eh, for 16 years. I developed áreas, in different areas, eh, providing, uh, acting as advisor to different organizations. And I'm always asked a lot of things. It was like a voice in the desert. I always said, how can I have a bearing? How can I make a difference? And I believe in this latest stage, since April of this year, in this latest stage, and I've tried to work, when I've worked at the Ministry of Health, it's in totally different from what I've been trained in. I'm an engineer. I studied public policy, and now I'm in the Ministry of Health. So this opportunity emerged, and when you don't have a work, a job, you accept this. So this became a huge challenge, and I realized when I started to, to become familiar with my co-workers in this whole work setting in this, and intercultural health is what I work in. I asked my bosses to create a unit of intercultural health, which was created after two months of uh, internal negotiation. When I talk about this intercultural health, my co-workers co co are 90% no, 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 are not indigenous. Chilean. And they asked me, what are you talking about? Intercultural health? What are you trying to say? What do you mean? And so I totally changed my working system. What I realized what I had to do with them is what had the state hadn't, hadn't done, which is intercultural education. That was the effort I had to engage in. I believe that the basis to be able to achieve this inclusive model that you're asking about is using education. If we don't have intercultural, bilingual, multicultural education in our countries, it's impossible to be able to understand both societies that coexist. Together with this, the history of Chile is about the, that people tell the story that is in their best history that's the best interest to tell, not the true one. There's lies. The, the history of Chile is manifested that openly that the indigenous people were savage. That's what they say, and that we had no social structure in place. That's what the official story is, that we were cannibals. And, and, we, and, and in wars, we, uh, we would rape women, we would uh, kidnap monks, we would uh, murder priests. But this, is the, this was the non-indigenous point of view, the way this his history was told, and this was imposed 
upon the in in academic teaching and so 90 percent of my work co-workers had heard that history and they even think i'm a cannibal they were careful i wasn't going to take a bite out of them and so they, they didn't know they, they had no idea. So what we have to do is start at the grassroots and start an education effort. We educated children. And this is, we have to treat them as children and educating them from the very beginning. And, and I engage in activities to try to state, express to them everything that they've been taught. They have to realize what really was it. Who were the nine peoples? Who are the nine people? They, a lot of us said we didn't know that there were nine peoples and then we we teach them the the ematopodongun language we teach the basic uh, greeting and and how to bid farewell and everything and, and so it has to be intercultural it has to so i realized my duty formal duty i had to set aside and engage in this education spearheaded and a lot of people come and ask me they want to know the way things work in the country why the mate mate is our ancestral doctor how can they look at and they can take samples of urine and, and, and predict the past and future of the person this is something and they know what without any tests conducted on without any x-rays or anything like that that cost so much how can they just look at a urine sample and decide things they want to know how is this done and that's and they're, they're, they're surprised, they're astounded at the accuracy of this because we want to save money and this seems to be a way. So they want to know how, what, this is what we have to do, inclusive. Make an inclusive model and it's through education and it's out of my sense. I can't do it. We can make suggestions, but the state has to be, take this over and that's what we're working on. I'm going to actually have to stop it there, but um, I want to take this opportunity to formally thank the panel. This has been a remarkable panel. I hope that they'll be available for a few minutes afterwards to speak with any of you who didn't get a chance to ask your questions, but can I ask you now to give them a round of applause? And my special thanks to the Embassy of Chile for making this event possible and to the National Museum of the American Indian for providing this absolutely fantastic environment. So thank you all.